DuPont presents the Cavalcade of America. Are people interested in chemistry, in the miracles of chemical research? Apparently they are. 10,000 people have written to DuPont, sponsors of the Cavalcade of America, for a free booklet and chart offered on this program two weeks ago. This booklet is called The Kinship of DuPont Products. It traces the amazing relationship between chemical discoveries, and the chart is a sort of family tree of chemical science. Perhaps you missed hearing this offer or forgot to send in your request. A limited number of the booklets are still available. If you want one, just write to DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware, and ask for your free copy of the chemical booklet and chart. Remember the address, DuPont, D-U-P-O-N-T, Wilmington, Delaware. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra sets the scene with a special overture based on three characteristic railroad songs. The railroad cars are coming, I've been working on the railroad, and drill ye tarriers, drill.
As the American cavalcade passes in review, we realize again the tremendous part played by the railroad in the building of America. But back of the railroad were men, dreamers, planners, doers. The men who helped open up the country, made it accessible to millions, bridged its rivers, tunneled its mountains, conquered its deserts. Men whom nothing could daunt in the performance of their prodigious task. On a June morning in 1855, we find two people in the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts following the ancient Mohawk Trail, worn smooth by generations of silent moccasin feet. Herman Hulk and his young wife. Oh, Herman, dear, I'm almost exhausted. Oh, couldn't we rest for a few minutes? Oh, not now, Liebchen. Oh. Why, we're almost at the summit. Come along. Oh, my feet are so sore. Why did I ever insist on coming on this terrible journey? Now, now, be brave. You'll be rewarded very soon. Ah, uh, when you see that view, all your soreness will be forgotten. Mm. Oh, wait, wait, stop, Liefken. What is it now? I think this is the place. Uh, close your eyes. Tight. They are closed tight. Now, give me your hand. Yes. But don't open your eyes until I tell you. Promise you. I might as well. Good. Now, this way. Uh, a few steps more. Uh, wait, wait till I push this little tree out of the way. Now, open. Herman. Uh-huh. Oh, I've never seen anything so lovely in all my life. All those blue hills are way over there. They are on the far side of the Hudson River, Liebchen. That is Albany through there. Oh, it's wonderful. And yet this beautiful Huzak Mountain where we are standing... Is like a great iron gate shut against the further growth of Boston. Well, how do you mean, Herman? See, where the blue becomes very faint and cold. Mm -hmm. Beyond there is the Mohawk Valley, the great natural highway to the west. Down it rolls all the produce of the farms, the trade and commerce of Ohio, Indiana, Iowa. Oh. Ah, but what happens when this great flood of goods reaches the Hudson? I tell you, instead of coming straight on east, a good part of it is deflected by this mountain and goes down the river to New York. Can't anything be done about it? Ah, that is why we are here. Something can be done, and your husband hopes to be the man to do it. I am going to build a railroad tunnel as straight as a die, three, four miles long, Right beneath where we are standing. Through all this terrible rock? Under this mountain? Yes, my dear. It will be the most difficult piece of engineering ever attempted. For no one has ever driven a long tunnel through hard rock before. But I think I can do it. Herman Haupt's dream becomes a reality. The construction of the bore begins. Years of disappointment and discouragement follow. Incredible bad luck dogs the undertaking. Heartbreaking, time-consuming obstacles are met. In 1862, under the Golden Dome of Massachusetts' capital, the state railway commissioners interview an energetic, wary engineer named Thomas Doan. Mr. Doan, work on the Hoosack Tunnel has now been stopped for over a year. I know it, sir. Herman Haupt and his company did a good job with the tools he had to work with. He didn't quit. He was called away to a government position. No man could have done much better. But that Hussack nightmare is too big for any single man or any single company to handle. Exactly what we've all decided, Doan. But the tunnel must be finished. It now involves the honor, the reputation of Massachusetts. And just how do you propose to finish it, Mr. Commissioner? Uh, the state will finance the work. And we hope you will accept the position of chief engineer. You flatter me, sir. Will you do the job, Don? Can you do the job? Can any man do the job? It can be done, gentlemen. But it will take practically unlimited capital and unlimited time. Unless... Unless what? Unless a more practical, efficient mechanical drill can be invented than any now in use. And unless some better blasting agent than black powder can be developed. This job isn't only a question of men, gentlemen. It's a question of men and tools. Nonetheless... I feel we are to be congratulated on one thing. At least we have found the man. What do you say, gentlemen? Indeed, exactly. we have. It is the 
summer of 1865, three years later. A vertical shaft has been 1,200 feet down to the heart of the mountain, and now work is proceeding simultaneously from four points, the east and west bores and both ways from the central shaft. One day, as the men were about to stop work... These blame drills ain't worth shucks, Ezra. I don't know why we go on using them. Because, dead as they are, they're down tight better than hand drilling. Mine's got to go to the blacksmith shop again. It'll be years before they finish this tunnel if they have to stick to these. Yeah, what's the trouble, Ezra? Oh, another drill gone to its last reward, Mr. Doan. Well, you're just in time to see an experiment, boys. Uh, call the others around. We'll see if we haven't got something that's going to help us. Sure. Hey, boys, call all this way. All right, Mr. Burley. We'll let you make your demonstration here. Sure. The severest critic you'll ever have all around you. Uh, just the ones I want to convince, Mr. Doan. All right, boys. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. 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 Uh, this is Mr. Burley. He says he's perfected a compressed air drill that is more efficient and more economical than the ones we've been using. Well, it couldn't be worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're going to find out. All right, Mr. Burley. There's a big piece of rock there. Suppose you start on that. All right, Mr. Doan. Is the air pressure on? All ready back there? All right, sir. All right here. Yes, it's on. All right. Here goes. Want to see any more, Mr. Don? No, I am satisfied, Mr. Burley. This is five times faster than any drill I've ever seen or heard of. Why, this drill will cut our work in half. Sure will. Now, if we could only find something that had more punch to it than black powder, we might get this tunnel finished before it finishes us. The Deerfield River is dammed. New steam plants erected to compress the air for drills that have been perfected to combat the granite of the Hoosick Tunnel. The gangs fall to with new heart, but still the work progresses with discouraging slowness, and the rock faces are moved back only two, three, three and a half feet a day. And then, some months later, Doan, the commissioners, engineers, gather at the tunnel's mouth to observe another engineering triumph. Well, I tell it about ready, Mr. Doan. We're waiting. All right, steady all now. We ought to hear it any second. And if it does all I hope for it, well, it'll be the grandest anthem I'll ever hear. Oh, she's coming. How do you know, Ezra? Oh, get mighty sensitive working in a tunnel. Kind of psychic, you know. Listen. Wait a minute, gentlemen. Don't go in there yet. The fumes are bad. Mr. Dole! Mr. Dole! Yes? How is it? Does it work? Work? We reckon it does work. Why, that one shot has done more in one second than the whole drilling gang could do in a week. Nitroglycerin was first used in a major engineering work on the Hoosac Tunnel. And with its use... The problem of the great shafts underneath the Berkshire Hills was solved. On November 27, 1873, the east and west gangs hold through with only three quarters of an inch difference in their center line. And one cold day in 1875, a small knot of men stood by a railway locomotive near the tunnel's mouth. Her brass was gleaming, her driving gear as clean as a town suit. Well, yes, we're all ready, gentlemen. Might as well climb aboard. Just a minute, Don. Who's going to have the honor of driving the first train through? Why, old Bill up there in the cab, I suppose. Well, I think that the commissioners will have a word or two to say about that. Am I right, gentlemen? Yes, you are. Tom Jones, this job took 19 years in the doing. It's done. And if there's one man who deserves the credit, it's yourself. Absolutely. Hey, Bill. What is it, sir? Get over there with your fireman. Mr. Doan is going to take the drop. Oh, Why, Mr. Go on, Tom. Get up there. Oh, all right. All aboard, the rest of you.
willingness to tackle any job, however big. The technical skill to master it. The stubborn determination to see it through, no matter what the obstacles. These qualities built the tunnel under the Berkshire. Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, also shows how these same qualities help conquer the greatest barrier of all, the Rockies. In the year 1862, President Abraham Lincoln approved a bond issue to finance the building of the first transcontinental railroad and urged land grants to serve as an incentive to its speedier completion. Two companies are formed to undertake the gigantic task. The Union Pacific, working from the east, the Central Pacific from the West. January of 1863, these preparations made at Sacramento for turning the first sod in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. On the outskirts of the town, a crowd is gathering as Leland Sanford and Carlos P. Huntington step forward to turn the first shovelful of earth in the great undertaking. Well, this crowd's feeling mighty gay, Huntington. Yes. Yes, I expect there'll be a grand bust in town tonight. Well, I'm sorry we didn't arrange for fireworks in the band. These folks are counting on a jubilation. If you want to jubilate on turning the first sod here, Sant, you can go ahead and do it. I don't. Those mountains look too ugly. And there are going to be too many months of hard labor between the first sod and the last spike. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, son. Get spade ready? Here it is, sir. I'll sand it up with ribbons. <laughs> well, give it to me. Well, Stanford, here goes. We start the great adventure. Make it a good one, mister. Got a long way to go, friend. All together! Yeah! All right. All right, Kelly. There it is. Now get your men to work. But, Mr. Huntington, sir, uh, don't we knock off and hold a jamboree? We do not. We start to build the Central Pacific Railroad. The Central Pacific started at Sacramento, while on the other side of the Rockies in Nebraska, we find in the summer of 1866, the great drive to shove the iron rails westward has begun in earnest. In 12 months, General Dodge laid 587 miles of track on the Union Pacific. Spring of 1867, and an army of 10,000 is spread in a long, thin line across the plains, digging, hauling, spiking, flooding. All right there. Steady, so. Come on, you bully boys. Get them rails off. Take it on the run now. Come on. All right, men. Tie crews ahead. Lay your layers, Nick. Gage and spike is follow. Go to it now. Lay them and spike them. Come on, men. All right. Now get your backs into it, my buckaroos. Lay two like you meant it. Hey, you rogue. Scoop us over for the cool shed. All right. Right, Jason. Hey, you devils. Keep moving till I get back now. Don't worry, Pat. We won't let you down. Morning, Rogue. Hey, good morning, sir. How are things going? 2.3 miles straight this morning. Not enough. Any complaints? Not feeding your supplies all right? Oh, fair enough. Them hardwood ties is raising old Nick with a pickaxe point, sir. All right, put two more men in the black mission. Yes, sir. We've got to keep moving, all right. The CP outfit are halfway through the Sierras. Once they hit the foothills on this side, it's going to be a race to see who'll get the biggest land grab. Ah, uh, we'll lick the stuffing out of them first. Well, see that we do, all right. But you'll have to lay six miles a day to do it. <laughs> In the passes of the Sierra Nevadas in the spring of 1868, an advanced engineer's headquarters of the Central Pacific, a young engineer enters the room where his chief is closeted with Carlos P. Huntington. Well, hello. What brings you up here, young fellow? Bad news, sir. Slide and headache gulch this morning. Wiped out five miles of grade completely. Why no one was killed is a thumping mystery. Well, how did it start, Steve? Oh, this last thaw. The snow started moving, and that rotten rock came sliding after. Doesn't matter much what caused it. The important thing is, how bad is it? The tracks are covered 25 feet in some places, the Huntington. It sure is a pretty mess. Yeah, sounds like it. Oh, the UP got the brakes on this job. Well, what do you men say? It's part of the game, that's all. And we've had something of this sort to us. Things were marching too pretty. Yes, sir? Yes. Grab a horse and go up the line. Tell every foreman to keep on his skeleton crew. Send the rest of his gang back here. Each man brings his shovel. 
Tell McGonaghy to get that steam scoop of his hand around somewhere and get his baby back down the track. Beat it. Right, Chief. Pick up as many men as you can and start working from the other end. Oh, and get a horse trail through as soon as possible. See that telegraph line prepared at once. I'll take care of things at this end. Right, Chief. And if these mountains think they can lick us, they've got another thing coming. Come on, Mr. Huntington. This is going to need us all. Each day sees the narrow threads of iron move closer as the rival gangs cross the state of Utah. The entire country becomes interested in the race between the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific. North, south, east, and west. It is the topic of the day. In a San Francisco club. Oh, Mr. Sanford. Uh, what's the latest news? Six and three-quarter miles yesterday. Better than the UP had done to date. Holy smoke, man. How do you do it? <laughs> no, I have to do a thing, my friend. The men have got the bit in their teeth now and are just beginning to make things hum. <laughs> Park Row, New York. Crowds waiting outside the newspaper offices two weeks later. Getting on to 11. They ought to have the report here soon. Well, perhaps they've decided to work all night, John. Mm, they might have said, Margaret. The way they've been making the dirt fly these last few days. Yeah. Well, see, John, look. Look, there's a man climbing up onto the balcony of the post building. So there oh, is. I hope we can hear. Yes. Why, why, in Washington, D.C. But do you realize what is going to happen, Mr. Secretary? Neither of the railroad companies have received any orders that are stop. And each of them, sir, has every intention of going on building in depth. <laughs> you don't tell me. Oh, I do tell you, sir. Now, this is no laughing matter. This is serious. These two companies are building alongside each other. <laughs> they won't stop until the CP is at the Atlantic and the UP at the Pacific. It isn't as bad as that, my friend. As a matter of fact... They've made their decision already. I recently heard from General Dodge of the Union Pacific, and he says, we have made an agreement to join the tracks on the summit of Promontory Mountain near the Great Salt Lake in Utah. All that we need is to have the agreement ratified by Congress. That will be simple, Mr. Secretary. Congress will be glad the matter is settled. I only wish I could be present at the uh, uh, wedding of the rails at Promontory Point. <laughs> Promontory Point, May 8, 1869. Hundreds crowd around two gleaming, wood-burning locomotives facing each other across a few yards of open ground where the last rails are to be laid and the gold and silver spikes driven. Indians in bright blankets, distinguished guests in frock coats and top hats, frontiersmen, miners, engineers, foremen, laborers. Make way, please, make way. We need room here for the telegraph instrument. Step aside, please. All right. Set your key up here. Yes, sir. You won't be in the way, and you can see everything. Oh, this is fine. The circuit open? Have a jiffy. All right, we're all set. All right, send this message to everybody on circuit. Keep quiet. When the last spike is driven, we will signal done. Don't break the circuit. The last spike will soon be driven. Got it? Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Durant? Yes. Are you ready, sir? Quite ready. And Mr. Stanford? Ready and waiting. Very good, gentlemen. Will you step forward, please? Will you take this hammer, Mr. Durant? I uh, believe you are to administer the uh, first blow. This, sir, is the spike. <laughs> I hope I hit it. There you are. Send the message. Done. nation, from one end to the other, in cities and towns and villages, hail the wedding of the rails. Initiative, courage, and indomitable determination had marked the great undertaking from its beginning. And when the two old-fashioned locomotives touched cowcatchers to prove that East and West were one, the people of America paid joyous tribute to both the accomplishment and the men who had seen it through.
thus had a vivid picture of the importance of explosives to great engineering projects. More than that, we saw that an explosive, like any other tool, should be suited to the job it is called on to perform in order to secure efficiency and economy. This is illustrated by a modern achievement in tunnel driving, the Cascade Tunnel, sometimes called the Great Northern Tunnel or the Scenic Tunnel, completed about eight years ago. Men burned through the solid granite of the Cascade Mountains in the state of Washington to make this straight and easy path for Great Northern trains. It sounds easy now, but it was far from easy to build. Day and night, three ships of workers drilled, blasted, and carried away rock deep in the heart of the mountain range. The regular schedule called for five blasts each day. Each blast took a little less than five hours for drilling, loading, and waiting for the smoke to clear. One interesting feature of the engineering, common also to other big modern tunnel jobs, was the use of a pioneer tunnel, a separate boring about seven feet high and ten feet wide, running parallel to the main tunnel about 50 feet to one side and about four feet lower. This pioneer tunnel had several important functions. It was connected with the main tunnel and was used to drain away water for ventilating and for carrying in explosives. Since progress on the smaller tunnel was faster, it was possible to drill up to the level of the main tunnel and work in both directions at the same time. From the Earth's surface along the route of the tunnel, a shaft was sunk so as to permit attack on the main tunnel at four different points. DuPont explosives were used exclusively on the Cascade Tunnel, and so it stands as a monument not only to the engineers and their men, but also to the in their laboratories, in fulfillment of the DuPont Chemist Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. which trace the interesting development of firefighting will be broadcast next week at this time when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. <laughs> this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York.